What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Inventing the Future podcast. In this show, we tell the stories of the visionary tech entrepreneurs that are solving the world's biggest problems. This is Julian Alvarez, and I'm a software engineer at Facebook and the co-founder and CTO at a startup named Vise. My guest today is Alishba Imran, an 18-year-old woman that is passionate about finding the intersection between significant problems and the cutting-edge technology that can solve them. She is truly inventing the future. Alishba is a co-founder at Voltex, which is a machine learning company developing software to accelerate the testing of energy storage devices from three months to three days. She's also a developer at Hansen Robotics, which is an AI and robotics company dedicated to creating socially intelligent machines that can enrich the quality of our lives. And finally, she is also a machine learning intern at Kindred.ai, where she is developing more intelligent machines using cutting edge techniques and reinforcement learning and imitation learning. In the past, she has worked with blockchain to solve the problem of drug counterfeits in developing countries. So you might be wondering the same thing that I was throughout all of this, which is how the hell has she been able to do all of that by age 18? Well, we'll learn more about Alishwa's mindset and the incredible work that she's doing in this episode. And we'll also cover topics such as how she thinks about problem solving and how she determines what technologies and problems are most important and how she goes about prioritizing them. And also for this episode, I'm doing something new where I'm going to be talking about some of the top actionable insights from the episode. So stick around to the end where you'll be able to hear those actionable insights. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into the conversation. All right, what is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode. Uh, I have Alishba here with me. So yeah, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, excited to talk today. And uh, yeah, to get started, I'd just love it if you could uh, start by telling me a little bit about who you are, your story, and what got you interested in this entrepreneurial journey that you now find yourself in. For sure. So um, I'm currently 18 years old um, and uh, working in machine learning and blockchain and applying that to um, a lot of different problems um, within robotics, healthcare, as well as energy. Um, But um, essentially, like for me, I have just always been really interested in like solving problems and really interested in um, like coding and programming. So when I was 13, 14, I basically self-taught myself like programming. Um, and then when I was 15, 16, started to get deeper into um, like deep tech and learning about like technologies like machine learning, blockchain, um, teaching myself a lot of the programming um, behind that as well to actually start building like my own projects and then eventually to, to work with companies on like real life projects. Um, so previously I've worked in the blockchain space. I worked on developing a platform to help track um, counterfeit medication within supply chain systems of developing countries. And um, that's a huge problem today because nearly 40 to 50 percent of medication that people are consuming can actually be counterfeit. Um, and so through the blockchain platform that I developed, um, you could essentially track and authenticate that um, every step of the way through kind of all the stakeholders, pharmacies, um, consumers, distributors that are involved in that like uh, supply chain process. Um, to authenticate it. So uh, part of that platform um, got integrated now into some work that IBM Blockchain is doing because they do a lot of um, work and just enterprise solutions in general. So uh, applying that to supply chain tracking in a lot of different industries um, as well. Um, And then I've worked on applying my skills at companies like TD Bank. Um, I was working on internal DevOps tools. So again, in the blockchain space, we were looking at Web 3.0 protocols like Solid, um, and wrapped and uh, also looking at just d- different decentralized uh, frameworks for digital identity. Um, so they had all of this like client data and we we're trying to figure out how do we use this to basically authenticate and verify uh, their, their clients um, and to help them kind of access the different um, financial services of the bank. Um, so that was a platform that I helped to build and kind of pilot at the, in the company. And so that's getting integrated now into a platform called Verified Me um, that integrates into some of the big banks in Canada um, uh, I am from Canada as well, so that's like where, where that connection is. But um, yeah, so that, that's some of my work in the blockchain space. Now I'm more focused on machine learning. Um, and so I've worked with a professor and master's student at San Jose State University to reduce the cost of prosthetics from $100,000 to uh, $700. Part of that work was developing a new 3D printed material um, and manufacturing technique to reduce the cost, but also uh, working on 
um, machine learning um, techniques for actually uh, manipulation for making uh, like prosthetics easier to use for amputees. Um, and then I've also worked on research in neurosymbolic AI with Hanson Robotics. So they're the creators of Sophia the Robot, um, who's kind of like if you've seen any sort of like robot humanoid <laughs> on the media, it's probably her. So I worked in her research um, and like uh, engineering for her manipulation. Um, so we, we had the chance to publish some papers there, which was really exciting. Um, and also for my work in prosthetics, I published some work there. Um, and now I'm, I'm working on my own startup. So Voltex, uh, we're working on optimizing and accelerating energy storage. So happy to talk more about that uh, later in the interview. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of a overview of some of the things that I've, I've done. <laughs> That is fascinating. Yeah. And uh, one quick footnote is that for anyone that doesn't know about Sophia the robot, uh, look her up. The only video I've seen is when Tony Robbins interviewed Sophia. And that was like one of the craziest things I've seen. So I'll include that in, in the show notes as a, as a fun little video to watch. Uh, but yeah, I really love your, your focus on the intersection between big and significant problems and cutting edge technology that can actually enable new solutions to be able to solve these problems. So there's a there's a lot of directions we can go in given the breadth of the work that you're doing. But I want to take a step back really quick and just ask like how how did you get started? You mentioned you taught yourself coding at 13 and that's very atypical. Like, where did that come from? Why Why did you just suddenly decide you wanted to start coding at 13? Yeah, it was kind of like, it was definitely very spontaneous. So like I said, I, I naturally just loved like problem solving. Um, and I, I like from a young age, I was just really curious. I would just question everything um, to the point where it was probably really annoying for my parents. <laughs> um, but that was just like the type of person that I was. And um, just when I came to middle school, I like remember um, there was like a robotics club at our school and I joined that. And that was where I first kind of learned about just coding and programming in general. Obviously, we weren't learning like, you know, cutting edge programming techniques or like Python or anything. It was just very simple, like scratch programming. Um, but even that, like I think was was so fascinating to me, just being able to literally sit down and have like a laptop and write a piece like a few pieces of lines and then now you have this like program that's like running and actually has some sort of function um to me that was just re really fascinating and so i think it just piqued my interest and then obviously i was working on stuff in robotics as well and got to do a lot of like competitions in middle school um in that in that area as well and so i would say that was really initially what sparked it so a little bit of exposure in school i wouldn't say i was learning like a lot um, so I was definitely grateful that I got that exposure, though. And then through that, I think I just was really interested. So I would just teach myself like in my free time whenever I, I had time. And then when I got to high school, I actually started to to, to go deeper into it. Um, and as I mentioned, like actually build my own projects um, and apply my skills um, to like real problems. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So it looks like it's a combination of both like a little bit of exposure through school and your environment, but mostly yeah. taking that to, into your own hands and applying self-education and self-learning to actually yeah. pursue that interest for, uh, forward and not just depending on what school would educate you on. Yeah, and I think that's honestly what it, what it comes down to. Like um, one piece of advice that I tell everybody is just like try to do as many things as you can do when you're young. Um, and like parents like always ask me like how like how do we get our kids to do this and, and like whatever it may be and my advice is always just like I think one thing my parents did really well was they just put me in a lot of things when I was really young um, so like I remember elementary school I just did a lot of clubs like I was part of like community groups even middle school I did like way too much stuff <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it was like it was good because I just realized like these are things that I, I like and these are things I don't like and I think it's hard when you're young to maybe know, you know, these are things that I like, but I think it's actually easier to know things you don't like, because those are things that like you're doing and they naturally just drain you or they, you know, that's not where your, your energy goes. Um, and that for me was really helpful because I realized like quickly things I didn't like. And whenever something piqued my interest, I was like, all right, like, I'm just going to go deeper into this. Like, there's no harm. I have the time. Um, and I was just learning. And my parents throughout that, like they tried to support me or put me in like environments or groups where I could, they could like I, that, that curiosity could kind of cultivate and grow further. Um, 
And so that's like, that's just like a general piece of advice. And so to your point about, you know, exposure, I think it, it really just starts with that. Um, it's like the first person you see that does that thing and you're like, oh, I can do that too. They're my age and they're working on these really cool things. Um, and that's another reason why I think community is so important because um, mm -hmm. it can be a really helpful kind of motivating factor to help you overcome the like very first internal barrier of like, can I actually do this thing? Can I actually learn this? I um, mean, when you see other people do it, you realize I can actually do it and, and you kind of figure it out from there. Yeah, that's, uh, there's, I don't know if you've read this book, this really good book called Algorithms to Live By, but it really makes a good point of the trade-off between explore versus exploit, where mm -hmm. basically anytime you make a decision, you kind of have a trade-off between these two things. And the classic example is, should I go to a restaurant that I already know about and that I know is really good, or should I try something new? Right? Should I exploit the knowledge that I already know, or should I explore and take the risk of potentially uh, getting a restaurant that isn't as good, or maybe you end up finding one that is as good? And basically, the book talks about how there's this trade-off, and uh, depending on your circumstance, like for example, if you're going to live in a city for five years or something, you should explore as much as you can in the beginning so that all of those years that you're there, you can exploit that knowledge. But if you're only going to be mm -hmm. in a city like one more week, it's better just to exploit what knowledge you already have and make the make the best use of it. So I think the younger we are, the more important it is to explore as mm -hmm. much as we possibly can and discover what we like and don't like. That way, uh, as we grow older, we can specifically narrow down and focus on and exploit whatever passions we have discovered throughout the journey. Yeah. 100%. And I think like, um, I, I love that book, by the way, it's like one of my favorite books. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I think that's like a really good kind of parallel between what I, what, what I was kind of talking about, um, that example that you gave. Um, and I, I think a lot of it is also self awareness, right? Like, it's hard for you to, it's easy to do all these things. But if you don't have self awareness throughout that process, then you're just doing a bunch of things, you're not actually like, you know, learning anything or, or, or realizing, um, something new through that experience and so I also think part of it is is building self-awareness from a young age and I think a lot of that comes through your environment parenting like learning about one thing I love is like philosophy and I think learning about philosophy is really helpful obviously not just like taking things for what they are but like figuring out how does that piece of it, of like philosophy apply to like my life and how can I use that to become more self-aware um, and a lot of self-awareness yeah. comes from just self-reflection and so if more and more people are thinking about self-reflection, I think from a young age, you you naturally kind of lead a life of more self-awareness, which allows you to be able to actually like learn from experiences as you're going throughout life rather than just like go through it um, and then kind of end up in a spot where you're like, oh, my God, like that's kind of what happens when people get to university and they're like, oh, I have to pick something to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> but like that to me is always a very bizarre concept. So um, I think a lot of it comes down to that. Do you uh, do things like journal or meditate to train your self-awareness or how do you usually practice that self-awareness uh, constantly? Yeah, I think a lot of it is just like setting, like being intentional about setting time out of my day or usually it's not every day because there's just so much going on in the day. But even if it's just like every two months or like every one month and you just literally put it in your calendar and you're like this for like one hour or two hours, I'm literally just going to sit down and reflect on like things I've been doing, like how I've been feeling and just like in general, just like, like your life. Right. And like, how, how do you feel? What's like your mental state? Um, are you enjoying the things you're doing? Are you not enjoying them? And like, really why? And so I think that has been really helpful for me is just putting time and like actually putting it down that I'm going to do this um, helps a lot. Um, and then, like you said, ways to train that I think are also, like meditating. Uh, meditating is like a really, uh, it's it's really helpful technique, I think, for being able to just be more mindful. Um, a lot of it's just mindfulness and how you can train that. And it comes differently for everyone. I think meditation works really well for some people. For some people, it doesn't work well. Um, and so for me, what works the best is literally just putting down like all of my thoughts, because I usually just have so much stuff happening in my brain. If I can just put it down and then like see it, then I can kind of understand what I what I'm thinking. 
Absolutely. No, I, I agree. I've been developing more of a habit of journaling and I've started to, I'm, I'm a notion obsessed with notion, but you recently, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you, you just have to, that's how you develop. I've, I've been developing my life <laughs> operating system through notion and it's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but recently I've been messing more with Rome research, uh, as I'm sure you've heard of. Mm -hmm. And Rome yeah. is really interesting because you can create bi-directional links. So Notion is more of a hierarchy, right? It's like folder structures. Things are embedded within each other. But Rome yep. research is more like a graph where all the uh, these ideas are kind of like in the open, but you can make links between different words. And on your point about journaling and reflecting on your feelings, you could, for example, create a link for each emotion like fear, mm -hmm. uh, sadness, happiness, excitement, or whatever. And then if you do that constantly, you can look at all the times in which you reference excitement or fear or sadness and see like what those patterns are. And the key to self-awareness, I think, is to be able to detect those patterns that are constant in your life to get a better conception of who you are and therefore be able to make the most of yourself from that understanding. Yeah. No, I totally, I totally agree. I think a lot of it is like I said, putting down your thoughts and then you can kind of understand where things are coming from and making a connection for like why, why you might be, you know, thinking a certain way or why you've reacted a certain way in a certain situation, like whatever it may be. I think just being able to actually think about it and being intentional is kind of the first step. Um, I think not a lot of people are, are doing right. Like the first thing is just being intentional about actually doing that. And then I think the rest is, is different for how you kind of reflect and think through that is it's different for everyone but um the intention is what's important in my opinion yeah that's the key that's how you make sure you're working on the highest impact things because if you're not proactive you're reactive and therefore yeah. you won't be doing the highest priority things um yeah that's really interesting so you've been doing a lot of things you've started with blockchain but now you're like going more into machine learning and ai so and I think naturally this is kind of uh, what you're doing more so with Voltix. So I'd, I'd love if you could give a, a brief like 30 second to one minute pitch on what Voltix is and yeah, the problem that you guys are aiming to solve. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Voltex is working on um, solving one of the key bottlenecks within um, development of batteries and supercapacitors, so electrochemical uh, devices. Um, and that key bottleneck is within long duration manual testing, which can take anywhere from three months to one year today. Um, and what we're doing is we're essentially developing um, a platform, like a software platform that can actually help to reduce that, that testing time. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, something you had mentioned to me is that currently it takes like three months to a year to be able to develop a lithium ion battery. And yeah. if you look at like uh, electric cars, one of the greatest limiting factors of these electric cars is the batteries. So yeah. the way you had described it is that if you can find a way to improve the process through which batteries are made, then that will enable like these cars and other things that use the lithium ion batteries, especially like electric cars as well, not just, um, sorry, I, I mean flying cars in the future, right? They're also going to need lithium ion batteries. So what, what I really love about mm -hmm. this is that you're, you're kind of taking such a deep uh, analysis into the problem to the point where you're identifying the problem in the process, not, not necessarily the technology, but the process and improving that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you think about like the industry itself, I think a lot of people are working on developing like the best, um, next best like battery, right? Like the next best like electrode, electrolyte that will allow us to have higher energy density output. But I think you know, we need that for sure. Um, but what we also need to understand is like, how do we actually optimize the process and development in which batteries are created today? Because reality is, is if we do have like that best battery that works really well, has the best like energy density, but it just takes us like so long to develop, we can actually scale that up at the scale that we'll need. Um, and, re and the truth is like, we're going to need it at a massive scale because like you know just taking electric vehicles the growth is is, is insane i think in the next like 10 years there's going to be like 140 million more electric vehicles on the road um that's i think i have that number right <laughs> but um it's, it's just it's there's a lot of electric vehicles but also just within like um, solar panels and like stationary applications where batteries are used today 
we need more of that. And, and I think it's a huge barrier for why, for me, like wh- how I got into it was like, why aren't we using like renewables today? Um, and one of the key reasons is because renewables are intermediate. So the, you know, it's not, and we don't have stable renewable energy that's running throughout the entire year. So we need energy storage systems. But we don't have enough capacity today. Um, and the reason is because we don't have enough of these like batteries. Um, and so, like you said, if we can help develop these that batteries faster, then we can actually help these companies increase their production and their actual scale up and throughput for how many batteries they're producing and actually commercializing hmm. um, per year. Um, and that's what's like kind of the the motivating factor for us in building this. Hmm. That's so interesting. And what, what I'm curious about, though, is that this is like a very niche problem in the sense that not many people know about it. So how did you even discover this problem like what was your process for discovering it and uh yeah how'd you go about it definitely um i mean both my co-founder and i are just really passionate about like interested in in this space and we think like this is something that definitely needs to be built um and we're huge believers in like you know we want to build this we want to create this future um and so for us it was really like renewable energy um like i said we we asked ourselves okay why don't we have scalable renewable energy today um key reason you know is energy storage or one of the reasons is energy storage um and so what we did was okay let's understand uh, why we don't have enough energy storage we broke that down further so we looked at key energy storage devices like anything from battery super caps, um, flywheels, like hydro pump storage, broke it down in terms of its entire value chain to really understand all the way from like raw materials to manufacturing to production, and then actually like scaling up these devices. What is the process like? Um, and as we did that, we started to kind of see themes amongst like the development process of long duration development um, that was like manually, you know, manual testing, um, uh, whatever the, you know, it might be in terms of long just taking a long time right and so that ended up being a huge cost um, and time um, for these manufacturers to actually develop these devices um, so that was the process it was really breaking down the root cause of what the, the problem is and I think a lot of it just comes from questioning every kind of hypothesis you have so when you find an answer to a question just keep asking yourself why and I think that is like a it's a, it's a very general framework that is used a lot in like McKinsey and a lot of these like consulting firms, but it works really well because that is the reality is, is you need to be able to just ask yourself why enough times to the point where you can really understand what is the core thing that relates to this like overarching problem. And that was really it for us was when we found this problem, we were able to link back clearly, you know, these are the things um, that need to be solved in order for us to have this vision that we have for the future. Um, and when you can make that clear connection, that's kind of when you know you've reached this, like the core problem that you want to solve. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, the key to doing a root cause analysis is just ask why, <laughs> like yeah. everything you can and combine that why exercise with um, using a lot of first principles and understanding uh, yeah. what what really does it take? What are the materials and everything involved? And I think when you combine those two, you're able to get to conclusions that most people don't get to because... It is surprising how few people actually ask why uh, repeatedly to the point where they get a, a new level of insight that most people don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, 100%. Um, and I think that's like one of my kind of key takeaways. Like I'm, I'm in San Francisco right now, so just moved here for the summer. Um, and it's just it's been in, insane because obviously there's so many startups here. Um, and it's very much like a build culture. It's like everybody is trying to build a startup or is trying to do something new and, and you're also in san francisco so i'm sure you can like understand what i'm trying to say here but i what i found is a lot of people are really focused on building like you know just like products that have very like gradual um like kind of like gradual progress on what already kind of exists today um whether that be like a SaaS product or like a, a new social media app or, or whatever and there's nothing wrong in that i think you know we need that but what we need more is people that are focusing on really hard problems and understanding kind of the, the root of those problems and solving those. And so um, that's one thing I found. And then I've also found a lot of startups that are like, you know, we have this like idea, but they're not even sure if there's a market for it. <laughs> they're like, you know, we don't know if this is actually a problem. We just built it. And, you know, there was some interest that so we're just building it. And so I've seen a lot of that as well, where people don't spend enough time really understanding the problem and then also de-risking the market. 
Yeah. No, it really is that difference between incremental versus exponential thinking, or in other words, like having that moonshot mindset of thinking how you can go 10x bigger uh, with anything you're doing. And yeah, it seems like uh, one of the core patterns in the work that you've uh, done and are doing is that you have this particular focus and interest in solving massive and complex problems. So like, w- where does that come from? Like most people, as you said, work on incremental, like, why do you focus particularly on solving massive problems? Yeah, I think it's just like meaningful for me personally. <laughs> like I-, I want to be able to do something that has like a, a pivotal change in the world and um, that's like what really motivates me is being able to see like this new future that can be unlocked or created. But also I just really love like something I've realized is I just really love solving like technical problems. Um, mm-hmm. Like that's just what really excites me. Technical hard problems that, um, you know, people are still trying to figure out. And and, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's like theoretical, um, you know, trying to build like the next best like ML model, but more so like on the applied side as well, like how do we apply that to a real problem and then kind of solve that um, from like the theoretical, but also applied side. Um, And so I I just really love like complexity and I love solving hard problems. I guess part of it's just Mm -hmm. like, it pushes my thinking, it pushes me as a person and it helps me like grow intellectually and as as a person as well. Um, And also, you know, alongside that, it's just meaningful. I think being able to create something that is pivotal is so much more meaningful um, for me and like a more meaningful way to spend my life than doing something that's just like incremental or um, just building something that, you know, kind of already exists or the world doesn't really need. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it really comes down to opportunity costs. Like if you're going to dedicate yourself fully to something, why dedicate yourself to solving a, a small problem or doing something incremental when you have the opportunity with that same energy and focus to solve yeah. something uh, massive. And it seems like you've been able to develop almost like a, become comfortable with discomfort in the complexity that comes in solving those massive problems. Yeah. And you definitely like you, that's kind of what you have to do. Obviously, like working on the startup, that's what I've realized is there's so much uncertainty. Like every day there's like new things that you have to figure out. Um, and it's definitely not like working at a company, which I've done, like I've done internships, I've worked at companies and I realized like, it's so much more structured, right? Like there's somebody that's telling you, here's like what we're working towards, like here's the milestone and this is like what we need to build. And then you just kind of build it and you have the support, you have the resources and the people that you can kind of backtrack, back channel on and rely on to do that. But when you're creating a startup of your own, it's very much like you do that. Like you create the milestones that you want to hit and you have to figure out why those milestones are the best milestones to hit. Um, and what is like the best way to get there? So really it's a lot of, a lot of it, it, it is, you know, being able to think and be thoughtful um, and strategize. I think that's what it really comes down to um, when you're thinking about creating something of your own versus just, you know, following um, what someone else has cr- kind of someone else has already predetermined for you. Yeah. I mean, that startup environment is super unstructured and that may be intimidating or daunting, but I also find the fascination of the lack of structure Uh, Like I find that fun because that also gives you the power to think about how you can develop things or how you can build systems and processes in place to do it. Yeah. And I think it's like really exciting because it's like you're building something that literally does not exist. um, Right. And so you're really trying to change the way things operate, which can be really scary. um, But at the same time, it's just really exciting because there's so much to learn from that and so much to grow, um, so much room to grow and, and, like just be able to explore um, and try different things. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, and, and on that topic, like you you seem to have a very great, a really good awareness of the problems, the massive problems that exist around the world. Like, and, you know, that comes in blockchain and what you're doing now. So like, d- how do you discover these problems? Like what's your problem for researching, your process for researching these problems and whatnot? You told us about Voltex, but do you have a particular sources or ways that you go about discovering these different problems? Um, I love research papers. So that's like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm just going to start off with that. I love reading research papers. So that's like probably what I do. Like, like 50% of my day is just like reading research papers and then like coding and then just like meetings is the rest of it. 
Um, but um, yeah, I think like, a lot, I, I think research papers are a great way. Um, if you're really trying to understand like, what is like, cutting edge kind of research or uh, things that people are building in a certain area that you're interested in. Um, that's, a, that's a good place to go. Um, I think our world in data, that's another good source that I would check out if, if people haven't, it basically just breaks down um, a lot of different problems in the world and gives you really good kind of data and numbers for why those are big problems. And I think um, that's another thing that's like really important in my approach for problem solving is like getting as much data as I can. Um, and that's just how things click for me is being able to like get a number for how big a problem is and then actually see and break that down to understand like what is really the core problem here and what is like the impact that can be created by solving it. Um, so I think that's like a great source to really understand like the data behind a lot of these problems and give you kind of the contextualized information behind why those problems exist as well. Um, so I'd say that those are probably my, my main things. Um, just reading a lot of papers and articles online as well. Um, and then um, looking at sources like Our World and Data, uh, McKinsey, I think a lot of like um, consulting firms also have like good kind of reports that you can look at. McKinsey, Deloitte, um, they publish a lot of reports on different problems or uh, things that they're focusing on. Obviously, it's they're consulting, so it's a bit different, but they talk a lot about kind of real problems that businesses are facing or people are facing. Um, and so the, the report, going through and digging through reports is also, I think, a really good way to, to get knowledge. Yeah. Hmm. Man, I got to start reading more research papers. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. If you're like interested in anything or like a certain area, let me know. I can definitely, I can send you some, some good papers. <laughs> oh, you're my research plug. I like that. <laughs> cool. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. And w one other thing I wanted to ask, like you, you're really interested in a lot of different technologies like blockchain, machine learning, AI, robotics, and you also are interested in a lot of different problems. So, you know, you and I, we both have finite amount of time in the day. So how do you go about deciding which technologies to focus on or what problems to prioritize? Like why, why did you choose Voltex, for example, and pro that problem, given all the other problems there are in the world? Yeah, I think it comes down to like opportunity costs, which you described really well last time but i think a lot of i think people I, I i recommend everyone kind of do this exercise but just like um i did this exercise like last week where i just sat down and i thought about like what are my core values and things that i really care about um and then also like if i reflect on myself like five years from now what is like the type of person that i want to be what is like the thing that i want to be known for or like described for and i think that can reveal a lot about like what you actually want to work on um, and like just problems and things that get you really excited. Um, so I would say like do that. I recommend a lot of people to do that exercise, like write down what you think your core values are that are kind of just like non-negotiables, right? Like if somebody didn't do that thing, you just would not be, you wouldn't be okay with it. Um, and so that is one thing I think is important, not just, just in life in general, but also I think a lot of those understanding your core values and things that you um, like your personal manual for like what things you need to have in what you're working on right um so for me one of those things was definitely like impact and like being able to do something that um could change the world and like was was actually pivotal um and that's probably what drives me but also i think being able to do something um being able to like build something gets me really excited so like um creating a team of people that are actually working on solving a problem or creating like a system um and structure around that gets me excited. And so I think just having that criteria was helpful because I was like, okay, hey, what I'm working on right now, does that allow me to do that? Um, and so I, I would say like at a, like at a higher level, that's what I would say um, is like the reason for why I'm doing what I'm doing is just because it kind of meets those like crit that criteria for me personally. Yeah, no, that's a great framework. Uh, and just having clarity on your values is helpful for any decision making, uh, regardless yeah. of what it is. Uh, but yeah, yeah, and it's funny Maybe. that you say what what probably drives you, <laughs> just because you may not completely know what drives exactly. you, or it's just like hard to fully articulate. Yeah, exactly. I was just gonna say, like, I, I think your values change. And that's like, okay. And like, I know that because mm. I'm definitely I know my values are going to change um, or maybe not change. Maybe I'll just get like new values. And I think a lot of your values come from like part of it, I think, is the way you grow up. 
Um, but I think other another part of it is just like life experiences, right? Like you go through different events in life and you're like, oh, like I actually didn't like how I was like treated in that experience or I didn't like how I reacted in that way. Um, and then you just realize like, oh, this is some, the reason for this is because I really value this one thing that wasn't here or present in this situation. Um, so that's one example, but I think a lot of it is life experience. And as you go through more and more life experiences, your values and what kind of drives you will change. But I think your overall kind of vision and thing that you're kind of moving towards should not change. That's usually what I found in most people's lives is if you have like this overarching vision for what you want the future to be or what you think you want to, you know, your involvement in the world, what you want that to look like, that usually doesn't change. But the way in which you get there might change, right? Like your your specific mm-hmm. mission or your specific um, way to get there could change. But that overarching kind of vision that you have for yourself, I think often stays the same um, or should stay the same. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's less likely it can change. It could, but that vision is kind of the core. But yeah, yeah. there's like an infinite number of paths you could take to get to the same destination. So uh, yeah. there's a lot more flexibility there. Uh, cool. One, one uh, last question I want to ask on entrepreneurial lessons is uh, if, if you could teach all young entrepreneurs one concept, whether it's related to life or entrepreneurship, what concept would that be? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things, um, it kind of ties back to what I was talking about before. Um, I think often when you're working on, um, I guess this is more applicable to, to deep tech, but often with when you're working on something in like, I think in general, just in, in a startup, there's like a market risk with what you're doing. And then there's also kind of a technical risk with what you're doing. Um, but I think what's most important is like actually de-risking the market risk. Um, Because you don't want to be working on a problem, um, you know, working on the product and like coding away all day. And then you realize what you're actually building is something that people don't really want or there's not a huge need for it. Um, Versus if you're able to actually find a market and de-risk that first. And then, you know, let's say there still is some technical risk. Uh, Maybe what you're building is hard and, you know, it's like an R&D problem that will take a lot of development and will take kind of pushing a certain aspect of tech forward. That's okay because I think at least you have a market and you know what you're solving is a real problem. Um, so obviously in some some problems like that, there is kind of no market risk. Like if you're solving cancer, there's there's a market for that, right? <laughs> like that's like there's there's certain problems where that's that's true, but other problems I think there is both market and technical risk or one or the other. But I think the market risk is the most important piece. Um, and I see that mistake in a lot of startups where they will just completely ignore the market risk and just kind of code away all day. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why you're most that is one of the reasons why most startups fail is because they're building something that there is actually no market for. Um, and so I guess for people that are you know working on startups in the audience, like I would just say to, to really keep that in mind um, with what you're building. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the biggest mistake you could make is to uh, build a product for a problem that doesn't exist. <laughs> and yeah. uh way too many people actually make that mistake. So it's important to first validate the market. And if the problem does exist, your only point of failure is the execution, um, which is a, yeah. a, but a, even, a better risk. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Even the technical risk, like you said, a lot of it is just execution. And But even within the technical aspect of your product, like there's so many different avenues and pivots that can happen. So that's okay. But like you said, it's just about how you execute on it. And there's different ways to do that. But if you do it the right way, then, you know, you know, the market is there and you're and that's like a better situation to be in than to not know if there's a market. Yeah. Awesome. I like that. Um, two, two more last questions I want to ask you. And this one's on the mindset uh, and psychology that you go from. Uh, because you're, you know, you're an 18 year old female entrepreneur. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, what are the challenges, living beliefs or type of thoughts that you have faced as a female founder? And in that respect, like, if there's anything you would say to aspiring female entrepreneurs that uh, might go through some of those challenges themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just like, um, one thing that I think, people should generally just do is just strive for more um like i've seen a lot of like other females around me that are just like they just kind of reach for less because they think that that's what they can do or that's what they can get or that's what they kind of deserve 
Um, but I think often, like just in general as humans, we're actually capable generally of more than what we think. So if you have this goal of like, oh, I think I can get this goal, then I one thing I've always been doing is just like, okay, what is like the next best version of that goal? And I'm just going to make that my goal. Because I think we always kind of underestimate our, our ability to do something. Um, and obviously that comes from a place of like, a little bit of, of a place from like um, privilege as well. Because I know a lot of people don't have privilege and might not be in the right environment to actually be able to get towards their goal. But I think that mindset in general is just so important to be able to have that self-confidence in yourself to be like, I'm going to to go for this, this, this goal, um, that's like, seems unattainable, or seems like it's harder than what I was originally thinking of. But I think often when you strive for more, it, it's better than um, kind of underballing yourself, because usually that is what you do, you do end up kind of underestimating yourself. Um, and that's like a great piece of advice I've gotten from one of my mentors. And um, it's just like a framework that I constantly think about as I'm doing things is like, am I underestimating my ability right now? And is there a way I can kind of push that forward? Um, and in my own thinking. Um, so that's like probably the biggest advice I'd give to just, just everyone in general. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most barriers in life are psychological, not technical. Uh, so it's, it's impressive how much just a belief in yourself and your abilities, uh, can get you, uh, to moving forward and moving ahead. So I like that. Yeah. Um, so cool. Last final question for you. Uh, yeah, so I'm curious, what impact do you want to have in the invention of the future? How will you invent the future? <laughs> uh, yeah, for me, I think um, with what I'm working on right now with Voltex, um, definitely the goal is to be able to um, help to increase the adoption of renewable energy and increase electric vehicles on the road um, through actually improving the development process um, of like batteries right and so for me that's a future that gets me really excited is being able to to work with these companies these battery manufacturing companies to help increase the amount of devices that they're producing um, and to get those into um, you know applications where we can help to make renewables more stable or to help create more electric vehicles um, you know using the batteries and so um, that's a future that I, I'm personally really excited about um, another future that I think is really exciting is just in general, like machine intelligence um, and working. Um, that's another area that I've been working on is machine learning and robotics. And I think that um, is really exciting because one, it's it's a hard technical problem. Um, but I think there's so much potential to be able to, to actually train machines to, to think um, and be able to make decisions and do tasks that humans are able to do as well. And so um, in general, that's a future that I think is also really exciting. Yeah, I like that. Thank you for painting a beautiful vision of the future. Um, so yeah, yeah. As a closing note, uh, where where can people find you? Um, so uh, you can find me on Twitter, which is it's just Alishba Imran underscore, um, and then uh, LinkedIn is just my name, Alishba Imran, um, and then email it's Alishba i seven three four at gmail dot com. Um, so either of those, either of those work. Amazing. Lots of options. Um, but cool, Alishba, mm -hmm. I know you're super busy, so I appreciate the time. And uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom with the universe. <laughs> thank you so much. Awesome. Cool. Take care, guys. We will see you on the next episode. Thanks for sticking around to the end. I will reward your time investment by sharing some of my top actionable takeaways from this episode. This is something new that I'm trying out, so let me know what you guys think about this. So the first takeaway is that I think the reason Alishva has been able to grow at such a tremendous rate and achieve so much for her age is because she has tried so many different things when she was young. She explored so much, and then she went and proactively applied a high degree of self-awareness through writing about her feelings in order to identify what she liked and didn't like. And after she found those things that uh, interested her, she narrowed down her focus on these things by finding the communities and resources to help nurture her interest for these things that she enjoyed the most. 
And I think this is so important because the earlier you can find what you like, the more time you'll have to nurture that passion. So the takeaway there is to go and explore and try as many new things as you can. Go research about them, look them out, find people that are engaged in those interests and passions and explore them further. The second takeaway is uh, to share or reiterate the exercise that Elishba recommended in order to reveal what problems you want to work on and what things get you really excited. So there's just two questions here. The first is, what are my core values and the things that I really care about? And two is, what type of person do I want to be five years from now? What do I want to be known for? Right? And just so journal on those and see what you find. Uh, And finally, the third takeaway is that Alishba mentioned a really great resource called ourworldanddata.org. I didn't know this about, I didn't know about this site before, but I went and looked into it and found that there was so much data on different types of fascinating problems, uh, which means that this is a great resource for you, whether you have a startup or whether you don't know what problem you really care about solving and want to discover what problems currently exist and are backed up by data. So go check it out, ourworldanddata.org. All right, so those are my top three actionable takeaways.